Welcome to this 14th part on server-side JavaScript and Node.js. This is the first out of two lectures where we go into server-side JavaScript, so lecture 17 will cover that as well. And we will do a number of things. In this first recording, we will go into some advanced JavaScript concepts that uh, so far we could live without, but it's, uh, it's important to understand them when we go into Node.js because it becomes more uh, relevant. These things are at the same time uh, probably the most complicated things we do in this course uh, if you don't know JavaScript because they are really a bit more advanced. Then in the second part, in the second recording, we will go into Node.js. So uh, that's simply a, uh, easily speaking, it's a, a way to execute JavaScript outside of the browser. So, so far we have always loaded HTML in the browser and then the, uh, the HTML file has included some JavaScript and that caused the browser to execute it. Um, we have Node and there are other tools for executing JavaScript without all of the HTML, all of the browser. But we'll get into that later. Now, this entire block of lectures, lecture 14 to 17, cover essentially server-side execution. Um, today we'll do the advanced JavaScript part and introduction to Node. Uh, then we will go into lecture 15, which is a theoretical lecture, which talks about REST, which is a, a style of structuring server-side programs or generally structuring programs. Uh, there will be no coding there. Lecture 16 and 17 then will be very practical. Uh, so whatever we might not manage in uh, lecture 14, we'll repeat there, there will be examples uh, that we'll, we will build an entire uh, API, an entire backend application. Uh, we will do some persistence using MongoDB and we'll actually deploy everything to the cloud. The learning outcomes I have here just listed for the four lecture block because it's hard to separate them. So it's a whole bunch of things. First of all, as I've already said in the second lecture, we will go into more depth on HTTP. So hopefully after this block, uh, you will understand in much more detail what, what the different HTTP methods are about, uh, what the different properties are like idempotence and so on. Uh, then we'll discuss the REST architectural style. So you should know that. Um, and then there are a couple of practical things like making use of a database to persist data, deploy to the cloud and so on. Now the uh, resources are numerous here. We have a number of, of references. Um, <coughs> the first three cover this first uh, part in the recording. We will talk about immediately invoked function expressions. Uh, that's one thing then we'll uh, we have this book here which uh, you might be able to access through the O'Reilly service the university has subscribed to, um, which it describes in more detail. For example, IFFEs, but the module pattern and so on. Uh, number three is a step-by-step -step introduction to the module pattern. I'll try to do that today, but if you want more reading, you can go there. Um, then we have Learn You Node, which is an, a sort of an extra thing. I'll, I'll mention that later, but it's a good application to actually learn how to use Node.js, very interactive. Then we have Node.js, which is just the, the reference to the uh, Node framework, the, the Node application. So you can go there to figure out how to install it, for example. And Express.js is a framework we will be using for server-side execution. Now, advanced JavaScript. Um, the first thing we'll start with is the this keyword. Uh, so that's a keyword that exists in uh, most object-oriented programming languages. And it's in JavaScript quite different from other programming languages. So look at this code here. Um, we have a variable called myVar. Then we go into a function, we say lock myVar. There we again define a variable myVar. And now this is a different scope. This is the function scope. So I actually have two variables. I have one in the global scope. It's global to my JavaScript application. And I have one that is local to the function scope. It's only valid within here. And now the question is, if I do console.log this 
dot my var which of the two am I actually accessing in most programming languages I would get B as an output so in most programming languages this refers to sort of the most precise the most narrow scope so wherever I'm right now I'm in my function so I'm referring to this in JavaScript that's not the case so if I call my function down here you will actually get an A as the output um, and that's something that is quite uh, unintuitive to many people and for a good reason we'll go into details now you can uh, also do something very different I can for example say I create a new object so the code up here is identical to what we had before I can say I have a new object in this object I define yet another variable that's called my var and this time I give it C um, and what I do down here now is I call my function again log my var but I call it slightly different I call it from the context of my object so that's something you can do in JavaScript and then suddenly you'll see that the output is C so somehow this keyword here has changed uh, it's not anymore referring to this variable, but instead it's calling uh, it's referring to this uh, one. And a final one to maybe confuse you even more. I can have an object that contains a function. So I define my object. Again, I have a variable my var, and I have a variable log my var, which is a function that just output this outputs this. Sorry. Uh, and then I can call it as I usually access parts of my uh, objects and then suddenly I get B so now it's referring to this so it seems like this this keyword is doing a lot of strange things and the explanation uh, works like this every function whenever you define a function uh, the, the this keyword is sort of determined depending on who owns the function or who executes it. So by default, the owner or executor of the function is where this is pointing. So for a method of an object, so if, if there is something in an object, then the owner of that method is the object itself. So that's the case we have here. The function log my var is owned by my object. Uh, that's why this points to my object so this dot my var is sort of the same as calling my object dot my var so that's why we get b now if the function is global this refers to the global object so that's the first case we had here the function is is not owned it's it's owned by my javascript file it's in my javascript file so it's owned by the global object it's global uh, which means this points to the global scope, points to my var. That's why I'm getting A and not B. And then finally, uh, if we have a function within a function, that's possible, then this would refer to the outer one. Um, and then finally, if we use strict mode, I've introduced that, this is undefined by default. So you actually have to use something like uh, down here to be very specific. Uh, this is the second case I've shown you. Uh, you can use the call function uh, to specifically say call log my var from this thing here from this object and then automatically this is being uh, pointed to to whatever is in here so that's the case I did here I'm calling log my var from the context of my object which means this points to my object so this dot my var is C um, this is something you, you need to digest a bit. Um, also, I don't, for example, I don't remember these things quite often. So quite often it's just that something you have to, to, to figure out when you get into a situation. Uh, of course, if you use JavaScript every day, you will at some point internalize this. You understand it very well. But if you just do it sporadically, then every time you'll, you'll maybe have to look up again how this works. But it's quite common uh, to get these things wrong because Quite some people are used to just using this uh, in the way it works in other programming languages. Now, there are some issues with this that are easily uh, missed, I would say. This is uh, exactly what I had 
what my third case was. I have a variable here. I have an object. The object contains my var and it contains the function. What I've done now, uh, I've done it slightly different. Instead of just logging, I've put the log into a timeout. Um, and I don't care whether this takes a second or zero milliseconds or whatever, but the point is the console log is within a timeout function. And now it's getting tricky uh, because set timeout, uh, you remember this is handled by the browser API, so it goes somewhere else. Uh, and then we have an anonymous function in here. It doesn't have a name. And this means in JavaScript that this function is executed globally. So suddenly, since this is executed globally, the owner of the function is the global object. So this points here. It points to my var. Uh, so suddenly, the output here is again A. Um, because we're pointing here. And that's something that's quite often unexpected. Uh, that's quite often something that might confuse you when you do callback functions, for example. So these kind of things <coughs> you might run into. Now, the reason, uh, well, not, it's not the only reason, but the reason why we have this behaving so strangely is maybe one of uh, the causes for having arrow functions, which were introduced in JavaScript version ES6. Um, and arrow functions, I wouldn't introduce by per se, but they're very common in, in many libraries and many code examples. So you probably already have seen them. And that's why I want to uh, show you to them as, uh, as well. So an arrow function is just a f short version of a function definition. If you look at this, that's, that's what you know. It's a regular function. I have two parameters. I have my curly brackets and I return something. The same as an arrow function looks just like that. So I just skip the function keyword. I just have my parameters. Uh, instead of the curly braces, I just have this arrow equals greater than, uh, and then this is what I return. So that's exactly the same function, more or less. Uh, and of course you can do things different. So for example, if you have no parameters, well, it's just an empty, empty bracket, uh, return 42. And you can assign that to something if you want, but now this looks pretty strange. But it's exactly the same again as writing equals function return 42. So it's just a short version. And then sometimes you have uh, more than one statement. So here, what we did here is always, uh, I returned exactly one thing, so I don't need curly braces. But if you have more than one line, for example, first I want to log something, then I want to return something, then you also need uh, the curly brackets in an arrow function. So you cannot leave them out. If I would leave them out, then only the first statement would be uh, would be interpreted as part of the function and the rest would sort of be treated as the next statement. It's not within the function anymore. Uh, that's the same in many programming languages. For example, if you have an if, if you have an else, whatever is in that if or else, uh, if it's just one line, you can leave away the curly braces. That's quite common. But as soon as you have more than one line, you need them. <coughs> Now arrow functions um, have one speciality and that's related to this, which we just dis uh, discussed. Arrow functions don't have uh, an at this. So they always inherit it from the parent. So we said earlier in a function, uh, a function always defines its own this keyword and then th this depends uh, on who owns the function or how we call it. Uh, arrow functions do that slightly different. So in an arrow function, what we do instead is uh, inheriting from the parent. Uh, this one here, that's exactly the same case as before. I had my timeout. The difference is what I changed now is instead of writing function, uh, I'm using the arrow function expression. And now suddenly we have a different case. We don't define a new this keyword within the function. Instead, we inherit it. And the inheritance causes us to inherit the this from up here. Um, and that this keyword in, in the context of this function is my object. My object owns this function. So this within here points to my object. Uh, the arrow function doesn't define a new one, which means this points exactly the, to the same thing as the this keyword in function it points to my object. Um, 
So this refers to our object in the end, which means the output of that statement will not anymore be a, but it will point to my object. So it will be my object dot my var. The output will be b in this case. Uh, and again, this is something that is quite confusing. Uh, and I would recommend you, I upload all the code I have here as JavaScript files. I would recommend you to go through that and to try to understand what's happening in the different contexts. Uh, this is quick, the way I'm going through it right now. Um, but that's an important thing to understand. Uh, and that's also why quite often you see this arrow expression. So in this case, we're not saving a lot of space by, by using this notation. Uh, but it's much easier to access the variable we might want to access compared to the case when we wrote function because then we were suddenly up here. So that's why it's used in many cases. Okay, so that so much for the this keyword and for arrow functions. Uh, what we'll do now is we go into two more concepts. And for the first one, I have to first take a step back and, and discuss some terminology. Um, because we often talk about these things, but they might not be clear. We have assignments in programming languages, we have declarations and we have expressions, uh, and they're quite different. So an expression is something that returns a certain value that can be evaluated. So for example, you all know the equals notation, uh, x equals five. This one returns either false or true, depending on uh, what x is. So if x is 5, then this will return true. Otherwise, it will return false. So JavaScript looks at that, sort of calculates the result and returns it. Now, this is very different, of course, to an assignment. If we say x equals 5, then we assign the value 5 to x. Uh, so we are changing the values up here. We're not changing x anyhow. We're just evaluating something. Now, uh, in depending on the programming languages, assignments can actually also return values. So that differs a lot. In, in some programming languages, there is no return value. Um, an assignment just doesn't return anything. In other programming languages, an assignment returns, for example, the, the, the assigned value. So this depends a lot uh, and it's not that important here. So we have those two things. And then finally, we have a declaration where we declare that the variable exists. So here we tell JavaScript, there is a variable x, please keep track of it. And from then on, JavaScript knows what x is. Uh, to maybe confuse that, we quite often see something like this, var x equals five, that's both. So it's both a declaration and an assignment. Var x declares the variable and x equals five assigns a value. Uh, we could make this worse. We could put all three in there. If we, for example, say var x equals uh, x double equals five, then we would first have a declaration, then we would assign a value, and the assigned value is the result of an expression. So we could put all three things together. But it's important for you to know that these things exist and know the difference, uh, because now the next step we do something that uh, requires you to understand the difference between expressions and a declaration. Uh, and th those are so-called immediately invoked function expressions or IIFEs. Um, what they are basically, well, they are a function and they are an expression somehow. Uh, if we take one definition, then an IIFE is a JavaScript function that runs as soon as it is defined. Uh, so usually, as we have done before, let's see an example. Here we have a function. Uh, we define this function, but it's not being executed. It's only executed when we actually call it from the code. Now, in an IIFE, what we do uh, is we write our function. Here it is. But then we add some things. And those are the things that I've put bold and underlined here. So we put the function into regular brackets, then we put the double bracket afterwards, and that's like executing it. It's please run this function. Uh, and then we have the semicolon. And what happens now is, as soon as the, this code is read, as soon as this code is parsed, 
uh, this function is executed. So in this case it says x equals 2 and then it does 2 square, that's 4. So this just returns 4. Um, and the result is uh, that we define a variable result and we assign the return value of this expression, which is 4. So the result is that result equals 4. The interesting thing now is this function can never be called again. It's an anonymous function and we, we put it into this expression. All we do is <coughs> we say, as soon as you get here, call this function and assign the return value to result. And then we're done. We cannot call this again. Um, so that kind of explains to you what this name means. Uh, we have a function that is invoked as soon as it's read. It's like immediately invoked. Um, and this is kind of, it's an expression because it returns something. We evaluate what's what's going on here. We check what's the return value and we return that value. So it's quite similar to something like x equals five, uh, double equals five. We're kind of evaluating what is the result of this and we assign it to result. So that's what it is. It's an immediately invoked uh, function expression. Now, <clears throat> there are some interesting things with this. Uh, and the first one is we, uh, we declare a value here. Uh, we declare x and we assign two. And because this x is within the function, uh, it cannot be ex uh, accessed from outside. So as soon as the function is called, our x is gone. Uh, and we can never access it again. So IIFEs, what they actually can do is they create some sort of privacy. So here we only return square of x, we return 4. There is no way to access the variable itself, it's sort of private. Uh, and that's a very interesting thing because otherwise we don't have that in JavaScript. We don't have this privacy that you can, uh, that you can make things private and they cannot be accessed properly. So that's what we can do uh, with IIFEs. And that's exactly why I'm actually introducing them because you can use IIFEs to create modules, to create reusable parts in JavaScript uh, where some things you want to expose, some things should be accessible, other things you want to have private. And that's a very common thing in programming. We want to have encapsulation. Um, so that's what we will use it for. Uh, and I'll introduce that now uh, step by step. And that's then the, the last advanced concept uh, that we do here. So in the first step, uh, we could, if we, we have data and functions that we want to have that are kind of coupled, that are together, uh, we typically create a, an object. For example, here we have var my person. It's an object uh, and it has an SSID. It has some kind of social security number. And we have functions that we can use to access it. We can get the SSID, it just returns it. Um, and this get function is also calling uh, a log function. And the log function just prints something. Uh, so this is just, for example, uh, we could use this to say, well, this is sensitive data. Whenever someone is actually requesting it, we put somewhere into our logs, we put that it has been accessed. Uh, this function is not very useful here, but we could use this. For example, if we would add more details, we could say who is the person that has requested the social security number uh, and save it in our database, for example. But the important point is um, what we would like to do is to say if someone directly tries to access the, the attribute, this should be undefined. This should not be possible because the ID itself should be private. Uh, you have to use the functions. If you can access it directly, then for example, we're not logging anything and that's not good. Uh, the other thing, the logging function itself should be private. No one should just say, please log. Uh, this should only happen internally. Whenever we call get, log should be called, but no one should be able to call it directly because it doesn't make sense. Uh, in this case, for example, I'm not really accessing the SSID, I'm just logging something. The only thing I want to be uh, able to do is to uh, use the get SSID function. So ideally, I would like to have an object or any kind of module, any kind of thing that exposes this function here, 
and keeps the other two private, keeps the other two protected from the outside. <coughs> That's exactly what I would like to do. Now the problem is, in an object, in this case here, everything can be accessed. So I said here, this should log undefined, but it actually doesn't do it. It's, it works without problems, the logging works without problems, the get SSID works without problems. So nothing here causes any issues. Uh, and that's not what I want. So the first step I could do is to uh, use an IIFE, what we have just learned. So I wrap my function, uh, or I change my object to start with. It's not an object anymore, but instead I define a function where I define all my, uh, my three things. I define my attribute and my two functions, um, and I wrap the entire things the entire function definition in an IIFE. What happens now is as soon as this code gets parsed, this function gets executed uh, and whatever is returned is assigned to my person. That's our first step. The problem is nothing can be accessed because our function does not return anything, which means it returns undefined. So my person will actually here be undefined. Uh, so now I've sort of gone too far. In the, in the previous case, I could access everything. Now I can access nothing. I just get undefined. That's also not very useful. So now we get to the last and interesting step. Uh, we have successfully hidden everything in here. Now we just have to actually expose whatever we want uh, to access. And we just do that by returning whatever we want to access. So in our case, we just return a new object and all it contains is our function here. So we just say, please return an object that contains the function, uh, the, the attribute get, get SSID, which happens to be this function. And now uh, I have the access exactly as I want it. If I do my person, here we have my person, my person dot SSID, uh, it won't be defined because it's not returned. It doesn't know what this is. If I do lock SSID rec, it's exactly the same. I haven't returned this function, so it's not accessible here. If I do get SSID, it actually will work. Uh, it will call this function, and maybe the most interesting part to us, this function actually knows all the internal things. So it's not like these this variable and this variable just disappear. Uh, they can still be accessed within uh, the IFE. So this is now uh, sort of the full circle. I managed to create a data structure that has private parts that I don't want to expose and it has public things that you can call and I can define exactly how I want that to be. So that's an important thing for structuring larger programs um, because of course here we talk about privacy. No one should be able to access the ID directly. But this is of course also a, a quality issue because if I can directly access a variable, I might cause bugs in the program uh, if that is not expected, for example. So this is a very typical thing you want to have in programming, encapsulation. And we managed to do that now by using these IIFEs. Okay, to summarize this, summarize this part, we essentially did three things. We covered the this keyword, uh, which is quite different from other programming languages and you need to have some time to understand this. So please look at the code examples. Uh, we then went into the arrow functions, which are just a short version of, of regular function definitions, but they actually don't have their own this keyword. So they, well, I'm not sure they really help us avoiding problems, but they give us other opportunities. Uh, and sometimes no one cares about this. Sometimes they're just used to write less code. Then the third part, we went into what IIFEs are, so immediately invoked function expressions, uh, and we use them to build modules. So parts where we can hide certain things and expose the things we want to. And essentially those things now are reusable entities, modules that I can include in my code somewhere else. Um, this is highly important because most JavaScript libraries use modules. They have internal parts which you should not be able to touch and they have things that you can call directly. Uh, once we get to Node.js, there's an easier way of doing this. We don't always have to define our IAFEs. 
but it's important to know how you would do this by hand if you actually write plain JavaScript code. Um, JavaScript libraries, JavaScript frameworks, a lot of them make heavy use of arrow functions of this. Uh, that's why you need to know them. And of course, modules are extremely common as well. That's why I taught you that part as well. Uh, but now in the next uh, part of this recording, we'll finally go into Node.js and actually execute JavaScript code uh, outside of the browser.